Good morning, everybody. Good Sunday morning. Glad that you, uh, you could be here with me uh, to uh, share in God's Word. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate uh, you be, you being here. All right. Now this is uh, we are starting a new sermon series, and I've called it uh, "Unlikely Leaders." And this is going to be a, a shorter study of uh, the Book of Judges. Uh, we're not going to look at all the stories that happened in the uh, Book of Judges, but we're going to look at uh, a select a few, and some some you may not may not have heard about heard about. So trying to get everything everything turned on here. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and let's get into we're going to get into this. And so this morning I have called the sermon uh, sinister, and this is going to be taken from Judges uh, chapters one uh, one through three. Now. Uh, one of the, our key point for uh, for uh, all of this is remember your leaders who spoke the word of God uh, uh, to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. All right, so this is what uh, we are looking at leader at leadership, and uh, I want you to think about some of the leaders that you've had and uh, who have instructed you, and I want you to think about the parts of their life that are worthy to be imitated. Now, as one of the ones, no leader is perfect, and uh, we all make mistakes, but uh, uh, I tell people, I think I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to learn a little bit more about leadership. Now, <clears throat> the book of Judges, the key verse to being able to understand it is, uh, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Um, they, and that's one of the take a look at that. Like I said, there, uh, no, uh, no strong leadership. And uh, what happens when leadership, the people, uh, the people fall away. So let's go. Let's take a look. And uh, as part of our introduction, it says it came about after the death of Joshua, strong leader there, that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, uh, "Who shall go up first against the Canaanites to fight against them?" The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Then Judah and Simeon, his brother, uh, said to his brother, Come up with me to the, uh, to the territory allotted to me and fight against the Canaanites. And I, in turn, will go up with the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went up with him. Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. They defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. All right, what do we see happening here? Well, um, they asked God. They listened to what God said. Uh, they enlisted help, and then there was success. And I believe that you know, if we if we will follow this uh, short uh, uh, th this short guidelines there, um, we can uh, we too can have success. Um, you know, they prayed, "Who go up first? <clears throat> and God answered, they "said All right, then uh, we're, we're going to help." Then Judah said, "You know what? I I know I need some help here." And uh, they got help, and the, it says the Lord delivered uh, uh, delivered the enemy into their hands. So we had uh, we have a success. And I think uh, what is uh, what is happening here is we see that, uh, like I said, uh, we see that uh, Joshua has passed away, and now uh, they are uh, they are in it for themselves. No leader from uh, the forty years in the wilderness. This is new uncharted territory for them. And uh, some of you may ask, well, why is this called sinister? Well, um, you'll get at this in a little while, but I'll, let, me get, <clears throat> let me give you just a little bit of background. Now, the word sinister, uh, if we look at the word origin, it is actually Old French, and it means left or left-handed. And uh, so that was one thing, you know, we... People, uh, you know, most of the population is right-handed, and uh, if someone was left-handed, well, there just was something not quite right about that person. Um, <clears throat> the right hand was uh, seemed to be God's favor, and so if the right hand was God's favor, then uh, the left hand, well, there had to be something, well, not quite God's favor. And uh, so, as uh, you know, as the words began to began to develop, uh, sinister uh, went from being left-handed to uh, well as we see it as being something uh, something that is uh, uh, something that is evil now hold on to that thought you'll figure out why why we call this sinister here in just a just a little while 
It says, uh, now the Lord was with Judah, and they, look, uh, they took possession of the hill country, but they did not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had, because they had iron chariots. All right, now. You know, there's always going to be, there's always going to be problems whenever whenever we're doing something, and we see here what was the problem that we that uh, that we saw. It is iron chariots. Wow. Um, you know, there's always going to be problems. There's always going to be things that we do not uh, that we do not uh, take into account. But what the uh, God said, I will be with you. But what happens? They look, they see the iron chariots, they see the thing. Wow, we can't do this. this is new military technology here. We uh, we can't possibly, possibly be able to co uh, be able to cope or stand with the enemy. And so they settled. All right, what happens next? Well, some more. We're going to look at Judges uh, 1, 27, uh, 27 through 30. It said, and it says, but Manasseh did not take uh, possession of all their inheritance, so the Canaanites persisted in living in the land. And it came about when, you know, when Israel was strong that they put the uh, they put them to forced labor, but they could not drive them out completely. What do we see happening? Well, they fell short. They came to a balance of power. Uh, they came to uh, well, what are we going to do? We have more problems. It says, but the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived there with the sons of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. I got a pro we have a problem there. We have uh, we have a we have a shared city, and we know that even today that that is uh, that is causing uh, cause lots of problems. What else with the uh, with the uh, with the children uh, with the sons of Israel? They've been tasked with uh, uh, with conquering the land of Cana, and uh, well, they are they are not fulfilling their potential. And I believe it's because of a failure in leadership. Well, let's look here. It's, uh, well, you know, we're going to hear some more of, this, more of the same. Same song, different verse. It says, uh, as we see here, it says that uh, Ephraim did not, uh, did not drive them out. And uh, the Canaanites were living in Gezer, so the Canaanites lived among them. Zebulon did not drive out the, inha the inhabitants. And so they lived among them, but they became uh, subject to forced labor. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. So, uh, so Asher, Asher lived among them. Oh, uh, it says, uh, it says uh, they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of their inheritance, but they lived among the Canaanites and its inhabitants, and they put them to forced labor. What is going on here? They've had phenomenal success. But now they've stopped. They've stopped uh, relying on the Lord. The leadership is not doing what they're supposed to, and they're having failures. Well, so, uh, something happened. They finally ran up against someone who was tougher than them. Then the Amorites forced the sons of Dan into the hill country, so they did not allow them to uh, come down to the valley. Uh, wow. The children of Israel did not have success. Uh, because they did not do all that they were supposed to do, did not do what the Lord had commanded them to. Why, what do I mean by that? Well, here's what the Lord commanded them to do. You shall utterly destroy them, the Canaanites, uh, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. They had been commanded since the time of their grandparents, their parents, and even they knew what, they, what it is that they were supposed to do. And why is this? Well, it's because of the covenant, uh, the covenant nature of God. Let me let me read you this, this portion here. It says, God said, "Behold, I'm going to make a covenant before uh, all your people. I will perform miracles which they have not been produced in all the earth, nor among uh, among the nations. Uh, for the Lord our God, He is a fearful. It is a fearful thing that I'm going to perform to you. Be sure to observe what I am commanding you uh, this day." Behold, I'm going to drive out the Amorites before you, the Canaanites, the, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Watch yourself and make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather, you are to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars, and cut down their ashram. For you will not worship any other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Otherwise, you might make covenant with the inhabitants of the land and play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods and 
someone might invite you to eat his sacrifice, and they might take some of your daughters for their sons, and the daughters might play the harlots with their gods and cause your sons to play the harlots with their god. When you enter the land, you're supposed to destroy, you're supposed to destroy the inhabitants. When you enter the land the Lord gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things among the nations. So the purpose of uh, driving out the inhabitants of the land was so that uh, the war that they would not fall into idol worship. And we see here, time after time, <clears throat> they are not fulfilling what they're doing. Now, what happens? Well, God sends uh, his messenger to them. And he says, I bought you out of Egypt and led you to the land which I've sworn to your fathers, and I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I will not drive them out before you, and they will become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. So God reminded them, using same use uh, many of the same words that He had told them. He had told them before. Now, what happens? Well, it is pretty predictable. We see here. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. Why? Because the, they had not driven out the others. They forgot the, uh, the, the God of their fathers who had uh, bought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves before them. Thus they provoked the Lord God to anger. Uh, predictable, predictable, predictable. And so what happens throughout Judges is, when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved with pity by their groanings because of those, uh, because of they were oppressed. So this is the pattern of judges. And uh, these were for a testing. Uh, these were for a testing for the children of Israel. Now, kind of a long introduction here. And uh, we're still not really sure why what we're talking about when we talk about sinister. So let's take a look at the crisis today. It says, Now the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened uh, Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. And he went and defeated Israel. And they served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. And the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. And the Lord raised up a deliverer from them. Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man, so the sons of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. All right, we see now, we see uh, why it's called sinister. Ahud is a left-handed man, and he has been anointed by God to lead the children of Israel and to uh, throw off the oppression of uh, the, king, uh, the king of Moab. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, there's an irony alert here. Uh, Benjamin actually means son of the right hand. So a left-handed man from the son of the right-handed man, and something that we read about, but probably you know, didn't pay, did not give it that uh, that much emphasis, is we see that uh, uh, Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. So the man, the left-handed man from the son of the from the tribe of the son of the right-handed, did not do what they're supposed to. And so, but what happens? God chooses this man. Uh, chooses this uh, this man to lead the children of Israel and to be the deliverer. Now, conventional wisdom tells us, and this is Mark Spitz, he says, past performance speaks a tremendous amount about one's ability and likelihood for success. You know, that's a lot of times we think of things, well, you know, they, they did a good job in the past. Or, you know, hey, they're, they're a pretty, you know, they've done well, so they will probably uh, be successful in the future. Or maybe even the opposite way. Well, they didn't do too good on their last outing. I don't think we better pick this person to lead this project. Now, uh, conventional wisdom tells us that past performance may be an indicator, but you know what? It is not the definite indicator. And we look in the church, it is uh, God's person for God's time. And uh, you know what? You can overcome your past. Now Ehud made him a, made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubic in length, and he bound it uh, under his right thigh, under his cloak. What do we see here? Uh, Ehud is preparing uh, to be Israel's deliverer. Now a typical sword was around thirty inches long, and uh, Ehud's uh, sword is around eighteen inches long. So what do we have here? We have a shorter sword. And what does he do? He straps it. He he straps it on his. Uh, 
on his uh, left-handed side there, or excuse me, his right-handed side. Well, why? Because uh, most of the people are right-handed and they place their sword on the left-hand side. And so um, right here, he's, uh, he is using his left-handedness, his sinister side, we might say, um, to, uh, uh, to smuggle in a concealed weapon. So what do we uh, what do we have here? Well, we have uh, we have Ehud, uh, the Fat King, and uh, let me read the, let me read this uh, part uh, part to you. It says uh, uh, he presented the tribute to uh, uh, Eglon, king of Mo uh, uh, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a fat man, and it came about after he had finished presenting the tribute that he sent away the people who had to carry the tri carried the tribute. So now. It Ehud is uh, Ehud is a, is along with uh, uh, Eglon, and he's getting ready to, well, be the deliverer that God uh, God has called him up to. Now, it appears as we read there that uh, uh, that uh, Ehud was not quite ready. It says that you know he uh, you know he w turned back from the place uh, from the place of the uh, uh, from the place of the idols, which is at Gilgal. And he's, you know, the thing we take a look at that that place uh, at Gilgal was where uh, Joshua had caused them to set up memorial stones to commemorate uh, uh, you know, crossing the crossing the Jordan River. This is also where uh, Joshua had set up his his first his first camp. And I imagine uh, I imagine the king of Eglon did this on purpose. But can you imagine uh, uh, Ehud seeing this and thinking, you know what? This is, you know, this is what the king has done. He has made a mockery of uh, of our past and of our traditions and uh, of our of our former leaders. Set up idols. A little bit of external motivation. He was nudged in the right direction. So what happens? Well, Eglon, uh, I mean, he uh, takes uh, he. Uh, Get his name right here in a moment. The king of uh, the king of Eglon. He uh, sends everyone out, and uh, he said, uh, "Ehud says, I have a message from God for you." And in one blow, he takes and he he. It says, uh, "He had stretched out his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into into uh, the king's belly. And the handle went up in after the blade, and the fat." closed in over the blade for he did not draw the sword out of his belly and the and the refuse came out oh goodness what do we see here he stabs him all the way up to the hilt and uh and uh, he dies right there and he keeps his cool he says then uh, ehud went to the vestibule and shut the doors to the roof chamber and locked them and then what happens? Well, he escapes in all the in in all the confusion. Uh, the uh, attendants uh, don't know what's going on, and uh, they assume that the king is is in there uh, relaxing. And uh, so, uh, Ega, uh, we see here that uh, Ehud escapes in the confusion. Whenever they discover, when they finally get the uh, the, uh, the um, servants actually break down the door and find their king dead in there. And it says, it came about that when uh, he arrived at Syrah, that he blew the trumpet in the hill country, uh, in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel went down from the hill country, and he sat in front of them. What did he do? He blew the shofar. He uh, gave a call to war. And uh, the shofar was, uh, uh, was a means of communication. Uh, and some, you know, we can see in uh, if different sounds meant different things. And so Ehud took and he uh, gave a call for war, gave the sound from the shofar that said, prepare for war, and everyone shows up. And we see that, uh, that uh, in all this confusion, it says uh, that uh, Ehud puts his plan of action. He says, pursue them, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So he went down after them, seized the fords of the Jordan opposite Moab, and did not allow them to cross. They struck down at that time 10,000 Moabites. And we see that. So Moab was subdued that, that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was undisturbed, undisturbed for 80 years. Well, we see here that uh, Ehud didn't let the, the stigma of being uh, left-handed deter him. 
nor did he let the, uh, the idea that his clan had failed to do what God had called them in the past. He didn't let that deter him. He made a plan. He executed it. He had, uh, he, uh, he had a multi-step plan. He communicated what, he, what needed to be done, and God was with him. God was with him from the beginning to the end. You know, my, my friends, I think we can learn from that is the plan, uh, you know, God, you know, that uh, God will bless you as you seek his face and as you follow his plan. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for my friends. Would you bless them and would you keep them in all that they do? And I thank you in Jesus name. Amen. All right, my friends, uh, have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.